switch to the picture. So last lecture, we've learned some uh, uh, two fundamental signals, unit impulse and unit step. We learned their properties, uh, the derivation of their concepts, and uh, the operations of those signals with other uh, ordinary continuous and discrete time signals. So uh, today's lecture, we, I mean, all the and my apology for some interruption because I want to make sure that I can see the chat window during the class for all your questions. Let me change a little bit the uh, display setting. Uh. Wait, can you see, can you all see the slides? So and this this lecture, uh, I would like to introduce to you a, a mathematical concept uh, called complex numbers, because what I've learned so far from uh, previous uh, course instructors is that, say in the last year we have a concurrent lecture in complex analysis uh, in this term. Uh, so you will learn about complex numbers from that lecture. But uh, this year, uh, if I'm, I'm correct, then we no longer have that course. So this signal systems course is the only course that you may uh, get in touch with this concept. Uh, why are the complex numbers important? From this course itself, we know that the central task of this course is to analyze signals. And later, as you, when you get to know Fourier transform, you will get the uh, sense that sinusoidal signals are actually a very fundamental category of signals for analyzing arbitrary signals. And uh, there happens to be a natural interpretation of those fundamental sinusoidal signals as complex exponential signals. And to know complex signals, we need first to know about complex numbers. So that's why complex numbers are important for this class. And also complex numbers are actually very important for all the future classes that you will learn in this field of information engineering because uh, some scientific insights, if you want to review some scientific insights or facilitate some engineering designs in information theory, communications, networking, it is impossible to do so purely with the real numbers that you know, you've known so far. So we need complex numbers, which is an extension to real numbers. So that's motivation to learn complex numbers. Well, technically there are a lot of uh, ways to motivate complex numbers. And here I would like to uh, choose one way to give you, give you a view of how complex numbers uh, are derived. Say so we look at this equation, this quadratic equation with one variable, ax squared plus bx plus c, where a is not zero. A, b, and c are constants. And what is x? What are the roots x for this equation? Uh, we've learned in our previous lectures, perhaps in high school, that there is a formula to calculate the roots. So x is, uh, minus b plus minus square root divided by 2a. But the existence of these solutions requires condition. 
it requires that b square minus 4ac is non-negative. In particular, if it is strictly positive, then we have two distinct solutions x to this quadratic equation. If it is zero, then it has base one solution, or we can understand it as two identical solutions. But if b square minus 4ac is less than zero, then unfortunately we don't have any solution because there is no square root for a negative number, right? That's what we learned in high school. But actually the phrase no solution makes the mathematicians very annoyed. They always want to find solution in any circumstance. And also the mathematicians like universal laws. They don't like to discuss by cases. So in which case there are two solutions, there are two solutions in which case there is no solution. They don't like this kind of case by case discussion. So they wonder, is it possible to find two solutions even when b square minus 4 is, is less than zero? So that this quadratic equation always has two solutions as a universal law. And the key to this question is actually defining the square root of a negative number that motivates the complex number that we, we are learning in this lecture. So to define square root for a negative number, let's first define square root for the easiest uh, negative number, minus one. So square root of minus one, we know that it does not exist. It does, it does not belong to any number that we know so far because we know the square of any number must be non-negative. Therefore, we denote it by i and we call it an imaginary number because we just imagine that it exists. So then with this definition, we have the following. i square is a negative number minus one. If you consider minus i square, so we can put a negative sign in front of i, just like what we can do with the uh, ordinary number that we know. The minus i square, the, we can just calculate the square uh, respectively for minus one and i. Minus one square is one, so it equals i square, which is minus one. Then from these two calculations, we know that plus and minus i are the two distinct solutions to the quadratic equation x squared plus one equals zero, because x squared equals minus one. Then a generalization to any uh, quadratic equation is that even if b squared less than minus four ac less than zero, we can have two distinct solutions to this equation. We just change b squared minus four ac to four ac minus b squared so that we have a square root of a positive number, which is well defined. But then since we flip the sign, we need to put an additional i to compensate for the minus one that is missing. Uh, in presentation mode. Okay. Oh, so, so you can see the slide in presentation mode, right? So, so we, which means you can see two slides. Okay, let me. Let me do this. Let me save it as PDF, just like what we did for previous lectures. Okay. And let me change to full screen. Oh, but this time I cannot see the chat window.
uh, sorry for the delay, as there are a lot of things to experiment with the with Zoom. Uh, now let me put the chat window to the other screen so that I can monitor it. And then we have full screen on the. Okay. So now it looks much better, right? So then, as exercise, uh, what are the solutions to this uh, quadratic equation? Uh, well, it should not be hard, so let's do it in half a minute. Right. Uh, this question, why is it canceled? Uh, I'm not sure what, what, uh, yeah, what is canceled, but perhaps uh, you may elaborate the question. I can, uh, I can handle all the questions uh, during the class break or at the end of the lecture. Yeah, I can see all the questions. I, I will keep them in mind and then make sure to respond to them. Okay, so the solutions to this equation, uh, just follow the formula uh, minus b plus minus b square minus 4ac divided by 2a, we have square root of minus eight and then we have to pull out the minus sign as the imaginary number i, so that we have square root of eight, which is well-defined. Square root of eight is two times square root of two, so we cancel the two in both the numerator denominator. We have the final result, minus one plus minus square root of two i. So I would like to show this example because as you can see, it is okay to put a imaginary number i together with the real number minus one um, with plus and minus sign in between. And we can also multiply i with a real number square root of two. So therefore we can define the complex number from this imaginary number. So this i, which is um, square root of minus one, we also call it imaginary unit. So because it's per unit value. Suppose A and B are arbitrary real numbers. So A and B are the real numbers that we've already very familiar with. Then a complex number is, takes the form that A plus BI. And uh, we use this double C to denote the set of all the complex numbers. So just like we use double R to denote the set of all the real numbers. So double R is a subset of double C. A, and in this complex number A plus BI, both A and B have their own names. A is called the real part, I denoted by A equals REC or REA plus BI. B is called the imaginary part, B equals IMC or IMA plus BI. And since the real number, the set of real numbers is a subset of uh, complex number C, it means the real numbers are special cases of complex number. And also, similarly, imaginary numbers are special cases of complex number. So here are some examples of complex numbers. Uh, minus i divided by three, it is a pure imaginary number but also a complex number in general. The imaginary part is, imaginary part is minus one divided by three. Pi, which is a real number that we've been familiar with, and it's also a complex number in general. And pi is the real part itself. Minus one plus square root of three divided by two i, complex number, real part is minus one, imaginary part is, square root of three divided by two, 
similarly for the following two cases. And they, uh, so the, ah, sorry, this was uh, hidden by the taskbar. So I put a remark here. A plus BI can also be written as A plus IB. A BI or IB means I times B. And we, we can write them exchangeably, uh, whichever is convenient. And here I would like to uh, give you some exercises to get familiar with complex numbers. Uh, so the idea is just to treat the complex numbers or the imaginary part as what we did with the other numbers and try to do the uh, plus minus uh, multiplication and division. Uh, I will give you two minutes uh, but don't worry if you don't know how to start with this because we will go through them anyway. Just try, just, just try with your intuitions. Okay, so let's go through those examples. Uh, so I to the different powers, we know that, so here we start from I, which is I itself, I square with, by definition is minus one. Then I to the power three, it just, I square multiplied by additional I, so it's minus one times I minus I. I to the power four, it's just minus I, times additional i. So we have minus minus one, which is one. And if we have i to the power five, it's i to the power four multiplied by additional i, so we have i. Also, we find the uh, law that if the i to the power different integers just a change in the cycle of four, right? i minus one minus i, one. So if we come to i to the power 227, four times 56 plus three, so it just equals i to the power three, which is minus i. And in a similar manner, we can calculate i to the power 412, i to the power 1009. Then, 
So the next group of examples a little bit involved because we have a square of a polynomial, one plus i square. So we can just expand this square using using the, the, the same law as the real numbers. So we have one square, which is one, two times one times i, which is two i, then i square, which is here. And note that i square equals minus one. And one minus one is zero. What we are left with is two i. Then one plus i to the power three is just the result above multiplies additional one plus i. 2i times y is 2i, 2i times i, 2i square, which is minus 2. So we have minus 2 plus 2i. So ultimately, we always we can always simplify the result to a standard format of complex number, which means a real part plus an imaginary part. Of course, either the real part or uh, imaginary part can be zero. Just like in this case, it's a pure imaginary number whose real part is zero. Okay. The next group, two plus i times two minus i, we just expand this multiplication. Two times two equals four. The second, third term are plus two i minus two i, which cancel uh, themselves. And the last term is minus i squared because we have plus i here, minus i here. Minus i squared is plus one. So we have four plus one, which is five. And we can generalize the result to any real number, uh, to any complex number a plus bi and a minus bi. I've just expanded it in a similar way. The imaginary part just becomes zero because the two terms in the middle cancel each other. And we, we, what we are left with is a square plus two b square. Okay. And the next two examples are the division associated with complex numbers. So to calculate, to handle complex numbers on the denominator, what we usually do is to multiply by another complex number, my, one minus i. So later you will learn one minus i is called the conjugate of one plus i. And the benefit doing so is that from the above example, one plus i times one minus i is one square plus one square, which is two. So we have one minus i divided by two, which is also the standard format of complex number because both real and, uh, because real part is one minus two, imaginary part is minus one minus two, and one divided by two. Okay, and with a general complex number, a plus b i, we can do the same trick. So the so we multiply both the numerator and denominator by a minus b i. The denominator becomes a square plus b square. The numerator is this thing. So we can eliminate uh, a square plus b square. So we have a minus b i, a standard format of complex number. So I believe those uh, operations are not very hard to understand so we can move on to some more uh, structured representations of the complex number so the first representation of complex number uh, is called the rectangular representation uh, the idea is the following so we have a complex number before we use a plus bi but actually we can use any notation say x plus i y its real part is x, imaginary part is y. Without loss of generality, let's assume both x and y are positive. But the same idea also works for negative x or y. Uh, we can plot x and y on the 2D plane. The horizontal axis denote the, is the axis of the real part. The vertical axis is the axis of the imaginary part. So we can mark x on the horizontal axis, y on the vertical axis, and we have a point z whose coordinate is x, y on the 2D plane. And this z, this point, is the representation of this complex number on the 2D plane. And also, we can plot this arrow from the origin 
to this point z and this arrow is a vector so we know that we can use the arrow to denote uh, to, to to represent a vector and the interpretation of a complex number as a point or a vector on the 2d plane are equivalent as long as the starting point of the vector is the origin so so this is the rectangular representation of a complex number and then here are some examples i plot this 2d plane with some uh, concrete numbers for the coordinates so let's have half a minute to quickly mark the complex numbers in their rectangular forms So it should not be difficult. Let, let me just take two examples. Uh, well, say the real part is two, imagine part is two, so this vector or this complex number is two plus two i. And then we come to, the, uh, to this quadrant. The real part is minus one. The imaginary part, if we map it to the horizontal axis, to the vertical axis, it is minus square root of three. So the imaginary part is minus square root of three. The complex number is minus one minus uh, square root of three i. So don't forget this imaginary unit, imaginary unit i. Okay. And with this representation, in the rectangular form, we can conveniently define modulus of a complex number. So mathematically, for an arbitrary complex number z equals x plus i y, we call this quantity square root of x square plus y square. We call it the modulus of z, and the notation for the modulus of complex number is the same as the uh, notation for absolute value of a real number. Actually, you can think by yourself and get the conclusion that absolute value is also the modulus of the number because of the real number, which is a special case of complex number. And the modulus is uh, straightforward to understand from this figure on the left in the re rectangular form because it is just the length of this vector. In other words, the length of this uh, arrow. And this is because we have x here, y here, then by the famous Pythagorean theorem, the length of this, uh, this line, this segment is the x square root, x, plus, x square plus y square. So this is the concept of modulus. We can also define complex conjugate of z, uh, which is uh, straightforward from this figure. So we have this complex number z, and we measure it with respect to the real axis or the horizontal axis. We get another complex number we denote it by z star. And if we compare z star and z, we find that they have the same real part x, but the imagine, imaginary part of z star is minus y instead of y because we are mirroring it from y to minus one. So mathematically, for an arbitrary complex number x plus i y, the complex conjugate denoted by z star is x minus i y. Sometimes we just call it conjugate for short. There are two results or two properties associated with it conjugate. First, if you consider the modulus of a complex number z and the modulus of its conjugate, then they are the same. 
the reason is that by definition modulus so z star is modulus x square plus minus y square because the imaginary part is minus one and z by definition x square plus y square so they are equal uh, in the slide on blackboard there is a typo here i, I wrote z square uh, z star but i actually showed the modulus of z star that's correction here and then the second property which says z times is conjugate z star equals the square of its modulus and we can get this result just by multiplying z and z star directly z is x plus i y z star is x minus i y we expand this polynomial multiplication the first term x square second third term are i x y and the minus i x y which cancel each other and then the last term is minus i square y square minus i square is minus one so we have x square plus y square which is the square of the modulus of z so don't for, when you apply this property don't forget this square okay using this rectangular form of uh, uh, complex numbers it is also easier to calculate uh, the addition and the subtraction of two complex numbers let's look at this example we have two complex numbers the first one is denoted by z1 which is 1 plus 2i the second one is denoted by z2 which is 3 plus i then the addition of these two complex numbers are just the addition of the real parts and the reactive parts respectively in particular real part we have one plus three equals four the imaginary part we have two plus one equals three so the result of z1 plus z2 is four plus three i but if we plot these three complex numbers z1 z2 and z on the 2d plane so i try to plot it as accurately as possible z1, z2, and z, we find that they form a uh, parallelogram. And this is consistent with what we had when we add two vectors. Right? So z1, z2 are the two edges of the parallelogram and the addition is just the diagonal. And since the subtraction is just the inverse operation of addition, the intuition for a subtraction of complex numbers, it can be derived from that of addition. We have Z, we have Z1, then Z2, which is Z minus Z1, is the subtraction of uh, uh, real part and real, uh, imaginary part, uh, respectively. We have Z2 equals three plus I. And we plot it on the 2D plane, so we have Z, we have z1 which are two vectors and the vector z2 which is z minus z1 it's just a arrow an arrow that starts from the end point z1 pointing to the end point of z so this uh, dashed blue arrow is the vector z2 but an additional operation we need is to shift z2 in parallel so that its starting point falls on the origin. The purpose of doing so is that only when the vector starts from the origin, we can have its end point having the same 2D coordinates as the vector. So if we move Z2 to the origin, then the end point of vector Z2, which is this black dot, has the 2D coordinates, which is the same as Z2. In other words, three and one. So these are the understandings for complex number addition subtraction uh, from the uh, from a geometric representation in the rectangular form. Uh, actually, there is another form of representation uh, to to represent the uh, complex number in a geometric manner. 
again, let's come back to this 2D plane. We have a complex number Z, which is X plus, well, here I, I will write JY. Uh, later, you, I will make the, make the remark that we can use either I or J to denote the imaginary, imagine, imaginary unit. It doesn't make difference. We can use whichever notation that is convenient. Okay. And its 2D coordinate is X, Y on this plane. We can represent it in another form, which is this. Here, C, this is the modulus of Z. In other words, it's the length of the vector, the length of the arrow. And the theta is the angle between this vector and the positive real axis. So this angle is denoted by theta. So given any point on the 2D plane or given any complex number, we can unique, uniquely determine it using two variables, using two factors. We can either denote it using its horizontal vertical coordinate, or we can denote it using the length of the vector and the direction of the vector, where the direction is represented by the angle. And the latter way to represent it is called the polar form or the polar representation of a complex number. Here, let's recall that the modulus of z is x square plus y square square root. And if theta is the angle of z, mathematically we have cosine theta, which is this edge divided by this edge, in other words, x divided by z modulus. Sine theta, which is this edge divided by this edge, which is y divided by z modulus. Note that the modulus on the denominator are always positive, but the numerator, either x or y, can be positive or negative or zero. So these relationships about cosine theta and sine theta hold regardless of the signs of x and y. So later we will illustrate this further using some examples. Here are those complex numbers we've already marked on the 2D plane using the rectangular form. Then as a practice, please try to convert those from the rectangular form to the polar form. Here in the blue color, I give you some commonly used sinusoidal sine cosine values of angles to, to facilitate your, your conversion to the polar form. So let's do this as an exercise in two minutes. Okay, so let's look at the polar forms of those complex numbers. Let's start from this one. Two plus two i 
to get its polar form, what we need to calculate are uh, their uh, its uh, modulus and angle. If modulus two square plus two square square root, which is square root of eight, in other words, two times square root of two, and the angle, which is well, it's um, obvious from the figure that 45 degrees, or we can calculate it in the following way. Uh, so let's denote this angle by theta. Then sine theta is imaginary part two divided by modular two square root of two, which is one divided by square root of two, which is square root of two divided by two, so sine 45 degrees. And cosine of this angle is also square root of two divided by two, so it's 45. So both the sine and cosine determine the angle, so which is 45 degrees. So look at this one in the second quadrant. quadrant. So the modulus is always easy to calculate because it's just square root of one plus one is square root of two. And then the cosine of the angle is one divided by square root two because it's imaginary part divided by the modulus. Oh, sorry, so the cosine, sorry. The cosine is the real part divided by the modulus. So it's minus one divided by square root of two. So it's minus square root two divided by two. The sine of this angle is the imaginary part divided by the modulus. So we have square root two divided by two. And so we can, we can understand this in two ways. The first is that we can just plot this point on the 2D plane so that we know that it is the second quadrant. And then it is obvious that this small angle is 45 degrees because we always calculate the angle from the positive real axis. So it's 90 degrees plus 45 degrees, which is 135 degrees. The other way, which is more straightforward, is just, well, it needs some, your memory. You need to memorize a little bit the, how the sine and the cosine changes on the four quadrant. So on the first quadrant, both cosine and sine are positive. Second quadrant, cosine is negative, sine is positive. Third quadrant, cosine negative, sine negative and the fourth quadrant, cosine positive, sine negative. So if you remember this, then you can calculate the sine cosine, and according to the signs of the sine cosine values, you can judge which quadrant this vector belongs to and get the corresponding angle. For example, if you look at this number, square root of three minus i, its modulus is three plus one square root, which is two, if you calculate the cosine of the angle, it's square root of three divided by two. If you calculate the sine of the angle, it is minus one divided by two. And since the cosine is positive, sine is negative, it compared to this figure, we know that this number or this factor must lie in the, the fourth quadrant, the so-called fourth quadrant, and therefore it is here. For a number that lies here, how do we determine its angle? We always look at the angle from the real axis, the positive real axis from this axis. If we calculate it, if we calculate the angle from the counterclockwise direction, we have positive angles. But if we calculate the angle from the, uh, in the clockwise direction, they are negative. So, let me make it more uh, explicit by using this slide. We calculate the angle always from the positive real axis, from this axis. If the angle is calculated from uh, in the counterclockwise direction as shown by this blue arc, then they are positive. You can see that all the angles in this direction are positive, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 135 degrees. But if we, in contrast, if we, calculate the angle in the negative direction. In other words, uh, if you calculate the angle clockwise, then the values of those angles are negative, as shown by this 
red arc, the all, both of the angles are negative, minus 30 degrees, minus 120 degrees. One more convention when we can calculate the angles of complex numbers. The, if we add any multiples of 360 degrees to the angle, then it still leads to the correct angle. For example, if you look at this number, complex number, which is minus one minus square root of three i, the modulus with two, its angle is one, minus 120 degrees. We can add 360 degrees to the angle so that it becomes two to the angle 240 degrees. And they are equal. So both of them are correct. And we understand 240 degrees as if we start from the positive real axis and go through, go in this direction, come here. So this big angle is 240 degrees. Both are correct, but usually as a convention, we will keep the angles in minus to plus 180 degrees. So in this particular case, instead of 240 degrees, we would prefer using minus 120 degrees. So that's just a convention. Ah, okay. So let's have a 15 minutes break. Uh, we start in, we resume in 12.32. Okay, everything is set up. Okay. The solution to this exercise, well, we can do the multiplication just like what we did with the expansion of polynomials, right? Well, put them together, have four terms after the expansion. First term, one times square root three divided by two. Second, third term, are the two terms with i's. The second term is this, the third term is this. Last term is square root of three times one over two times i square. Here, I did one step further, just replace the i square with minus one. So that's why we have minus sign here. And we need to organize real and the reactive parts uh, respectively. So which means for the real part, we have square root of three divided by two minus the same thing. So we have real part is equal zero. Imaginary, imaginary part, three divided by two plus one divided by two. So we have two, don't forget the i, so the result is two i. And actually, we can calculate the same multiplication in a polar form. What do I mean? polar form, we can convert Z1, Z2 respectively to the polar form. Z1 converted to the polar form, the modulus is square root one plus three, which is two. Angle is 60 degrees. Well, perhaps to calculate the angle, you need to memorize or look up the sine or cosine values of the commonly used angles. And uh, well, since this is the simplest case because both the real and the imaginary parts are positive. So the angle just fall in the uh, range of zero to 90 degrees. It turns out to be 60 degrees. And in a similar manner, the modulus of Z2 is just one and the angle is 30 degrees. But because cosine 30 degrees is square root of three divided by two, sine 30 degrees one divided by two. And in the polar form, the multiplication is much straightforward. It's just the product of the two modulus. And the angle is just the summation of the two angles. So two times one, the modulus of two, 60 degrees plus 30 degrees, angle is 90 degrees. Two with angle 90 degrees, if we plot it in the 2D plane, so the modulus is two, 90 degrees, so it just points to the positive direction of the imaginary, imaginary axis, which turns out to be 2i. So we have the same result. And to generalize this example, we have two complex numbers written in their own polar forms. 
then, well, let's assume that the modulus of Z2 is not zero. Then the uh, summation, uh, then, then the multiplication of Z1, Z2, the, in the polar form, the modulus is the product of the two modulus. The angle is the summation of the two angles. And since division is the inverse operation of inverse operator of uh, multiplication, then Z1 divided by Z2, we can derive it as the modulus is Z1 modulus divided by Z2 modulus. Know that the denominator cannot be zero. And the angle is the numerator's angle minus the denominator's angle. So this is a minus sign minus the denominator's angle. So this is a general law that you can conveniently apply in calculating the multiplication division of complex numbers in polar forms. Actually, we can also redefine the concept of uh, complex conjugate in the polar form. So recall that for x plus i, y, its conjugate is x minus i, y. And we write both numbers in the polar form. Say x plus i, y took the polar form z absolute value angle theta. Then the polar form of x minus i, y has the same modulus, but the angle changes from theta to minus theta. This change is straightforward from this figure because the conjugate is just a mirroring with respect to the horizontal axis. So originally the angle is theta, and now we are changing the direction, so it becomes negative theta, minus theta. And it's also, it can also be obtained in mathematical derivation because the, if you look at the cosine of this angle, minus theta, cosine minus theta equals cosine theta, which is x divided by z because from this representation, cosine theta is x divided by the modulus of z. Sine minus theta is sine theta with a mi minus sine in front is minus y divided by z modulus because if you look at sine theta itself from the original z, sine theta is y divided by z. That's why sine minus theta is minus y divided by z, which is the imaginary part of z star divided by z modulus. Okay. Therefore, the conclusion is for an arbitrary complex number, its complex conjugate has the same modulus and with an additional negative sign in front of the angle. And this theorem, z z star equals z modulus square still holds, but it can be proved much easier using the polar representation because from this formula, z times this uh, z conjugate is just the product, the modulus is just product of their modulus, but their modulus are equal. Both of their modulus are z modulus. And if you look at the angle, it's the angle of z plus the angle of z star, but the angle of z star is minus theta, so it's theta minus theta, it's zero. So we have some complex number whose angle is zero. It means this number just lie in the real axis. So it's a real number, just the real number z modulus square. Okay, this is a complex conjugate redefined in the polar form. Now let's come to the complex exponential, which I promised. So, Ah, here is the remark that I, I mentioned earlier ago. We use, usually use i, which is square root minus one as the imaginary unit, but sometimes we also use j. So we use i and j interchangeably. Well, just from, uh, just by your own uh, preference. Uh, later in the class, we more often use j uh, because sometimes i is used as the index for something else. So we want, don't want to uh, confuse them. So sometimes we, we use j more often in this class. For example, 2 plus i and 2 plus j are the same complex number. 
So now let's look at the polar representation of complex number Z, which is modulus angle theta. And we know that it can be written as X plus JY. And X divided by, so let me revert a little bit to the, to this, to this slide. Ah. So let's, let's remind us about this uh, relationship. Sin, cosine theta is X divided by Z modulus, sine theta Y divided by Z modulus. So X plus JY can be written as Z modulus times cosine theta plus J, Z modulus times sine theta. So don't forget this imaginary unit J. And we can write it as Z modulus times exponential J theta. So we We've learned exponential numbers before, but usually the exponent we know are real numbers. This is the first time that we see exponent as a imaginary, imaginary number. And in particular, if we eliminate Z from both sides of this equation, what we have is exponential J theta equals cosine theta plus J times sine theta. Okay. And let me explain a little bit how we obtain this relationship. Actually, this relationship is obtained by applying the Tyler expansion to any continuous function. So let's say we have a general function f of x, which is uh, infinitely ordered differentiable and smooth at the point x equals zero. Then we can write f x in its Taylor series form, which is f of zero plus a first order term of x. And the coefficient for this first order term is df dx taken value at, taking value at x equals zero. And then followed by a second order term, x squared divided by two factorial. And the coefficient, the additional coefficient in front of the second order term is the second order derivative of fx taking value at x zero and so on. We have third order term, fourth order term until the infinite order. Applying this Taylor series to the standard exponential functions, see we have exponential x. Then the zero order term just replacing x with zero because we are expanding it in Taylor series with zero as the reference point. The first order term x, in front of it is the coefficient dex dx, which is e of x is e to the power x itself. Then we have e to the power x taking value at x equals zero, so e to the power zero. Second order term, third order term, and so on. But for all those terms, the coefficients are the same because if we take the any order derivative of exponential x, it still keeps to be itself. So we always have e to the power x taking value at x equals zero. So e to the power zero, e to the power zero, and so on. e to the power zero, we know that it equals one. So exponential x, the Tyler expansion is one plus x plus x squared divided by two factorial, x cubic divided by three factorial, and so on. This holds for any x. And before we only know that it holds for real number x, but actually it holds for imaginary number x as well. So without loss of generality, let's replace x with a imaginary number j theta. Just replace x with j theta. But note that we have j theta square. We leave theta square on the numerator, but the j square becomes minus one. And j theta cubic, we have theta cubic here. j cubic, we've seen it in the previous example, is minus j, so minus j. Don't forget the minus sign. And then fourth order term, j theta to the power of four, we have theta to the power of four times one because j to the power of four is one as we see from the previous example. Note that j to the power of n changes 
with n in the cycle of four. So every time n to change n to n plus four, j to the power n come back to itself. And then we organize this Tyler series for exponential j theta in two parts. The two parts are respectively the real part and the imaginary part. So this, this, this come to the real part because it does not have j. One minus theta squared divided by two factorial plus theta to the power four divided by four factorial and so on. And similarly for the real imaginary part which has this j in front, they are the second term, the fourth term, the sixth term. So theta minus theta to the power three by the three factorial. So all the theta to the odd number powers are in the imaginary part and to the even number powers are in the real part. So this is exponential j theta. We put it here to remind us and then let's move further to cosine theta and sine theta. We can also expand cosine theta and sine theta using the same Taylor series law, using the same equation here. So just consider fx to be cosine x and then substitute x with theta, we have the following. The first term is replacing theta, is obtained by replacing theta with zero, so cosine zero. Second term, with the first order term, we have theta here, the coefficient, we first calculate the derivative of cosine theta, which is a minus sine theta. Taking value at zero, we have minus sine zero, which is zero. So the act, actually the first order term becomes zero. In a similar way, the second order term, so we have sine, the second order derivative of cosine theta is the first order derivative of the minus sine theta, which is minus cosine theta. Taking value at zero, we have minus one. So minus one here. In a similar way, we can get the full Taylor expansion of cosine theta, which is this. I will skip the Taylor expansion of sine theta because it just applies the same equation here. The result is this. If we compare cosine theta sine theta with this expression of exponential j theta, we find magically that Cosine theta equals the real part of exponential j theta. Sine theta equals the imaginary part. So we have exponential j theta equals cosine theta plus j sine theta. Okay. So that's the derivation of this relationship. And therefore, for a complex number written in the polar form z modulus angle theta, we can equivalently write it as z modulus exponential j theta. Because both of these forms, both the standard polar form and the complex exponential form, so we call the latter the complex exponential form because we have complex number on the exponent. Both forms only requires the modulus and the angle. So in the future, we will not distinguish the polar exponential forms. In other words, when I say polar form, you can either write it in this way or in this way. So both of them are polar forms. And we can rewrite the multiplication formulas in the polar exponential forms. So polar forms, we can change them to exponential j theta one, exponential j theta two, theta one, theta two are respectively the angles of z one, z two. And then modulus are the multiplication, angle is the summation. For division, modulus is the division of two modulus. The angle is the subtraction of the uh, angles. And it is, uh, it is more straightforward to understand this ex exponential form because if we consider z1 times z2, so the multiplication of modulus just copy down here. And we have exponential j theta one times exponential j theta two. We've learned that if we have 
e to the power a times e to the power b, then we get e to the power a plus b. This also holds for imaginary number. So exponential j theta one times exponential j theta two, we have exponential j theta one plus theta two. So the complex exponential form of the polar representation facilitates a more intuitive understanding of the uh, complex number multiplication. Uh, no, the derivation of this Euler, oh, by the way, this, I forgot to mention, uh, and I forgot to put on the slide that this, this equation is called the Euler's equation. Uh, the derivation of this equation is for your interest only. Uh, I will not examine this derivation itself. Uh, now, let's come to a exercise. This exercise, let's, let me give you uh, three minutes, uh, three minutes for it. Yes. Uh, the complex plane is very similar to the xy axis plane, uh, although we don't call it xy. Uh, we use real and imaginary to replace xy. Yes. And I received this private question why the angle after modulus is equal to cosine theta plus r? So if you're asking why this angle equals cosine theta plus j sine theta. That, that's exactly what I derived in these two slides. So the angle in the complex exponential form, complex exponential using the Euler's equation, it is a complex number whose real part and imaginary part are respectively cosine and sine. angle theta. Oh, you mean the angle theta equals this? Oh, the, you mean this part, this, this, this part, right? Uh, this part because I come to, I'll come back to this slide, right? Cosine theta is x divided by z modulus. So x equals cosine theta times z modulus. A similar y equals sine theta times z modulus. Because it is, or if you're also x plus jy, so that's why it can be written this way. Okay, let me go through this exercise. Express both numbers in polar form. So polar form, uh, let me uh, recall this procedure. We first need to calculate that there are modulus. Z1 modulus is one plus three square root, which is two. And then we look at its angle. So if after we extract the modulus two, what is left is one over two plus square root of three divided by two j. And the real and imaginary part corresponds to the cosine and sine of the angle. And by looking up or by memory, we know that one over two is cosine pi divided by three. Square root of three divided by two is sine pi divided by three. So if this 
uh, using what we already learned is exponential j to the power pi divided by three. So as I said, we can just leave this as it is because it's already the polar form. And similarly, z2 modulus square root of uh, x square plus y square, which is four. After extracting four, what's left in the brackets are the cosine and the sines of theta. And here, because cosine is positive, sine is negative, we know that this angle must lie in the so-called fourth quadrant. So this part. That's why it's minus pi divided by six. And if you look up those cosine sine values, they are exactly the same as those two numbers. And therefore the angle is minus pi divided by six. So you can put the minus sign anywhere, even in front of the imaginary unit chain. This is also a, a valid polar form of the number. If we plot them on the complex plane, z1, the length of the vector is two, and the angle is pi divided by three, 60 degrees. Z2, the length of the angle is the modular four. The, uh, the, the length of the vector is four. The angle is minus pi divided by six, minus 30 degrees. Since it's minus, so we uh, count it clockwise from the real axis. Z1, Z2. Calculate Z1, Z2 in both rectangular and polar forms. Uh, in rectangular forms, we just expand their multiplication in four terms. The first and the last term are the real part. The last term we have minus j square, two square root of three, replace minus j square with minus one. So we have plus two divided by uh, two square root of three. And the two terms in the middle, both carrying an imaginary unit j, so they can be put together. So 6j minus 2j. The result is 4j. For the real part, the result is 2 square root of 3, 2 square root of 3, so 4 square root of 3. But the polar form is much more straightforward. We've already calculated the polar form in the slide above. And the modulus of the product is just the product of the modulus. 2 times 4 equals 8. The angle of the product is the summation of two angles. So it's summation of pi divided by three and minus pi divided by six. So we have eight exponential j pi divided by six. And the division in a similar way can be calculated in both rectangular and polar forms. In rectangular form, remember the trick that I introduced at the beginning of the class because we have a complex number on the denominator, the common trick is to multiply both the denominator and the numerator with its complex conjugate. For the denominator, a number multiplies its complex conjugate just equals the square of its modulus. So in other words, the real part of square plus imaginary part of square. And for the, for the numerator, the calculation need to be more careful because we need to get the full expansion with the four terms. Organizing the real and the imaginary part respectively, we have the numerator as j times h, denominator is 16, so j times one over two. But in polar form, it's much simpler. Just write both denominator and numerator in the polar form, Modulus is the division of the two modulus, so one over two. The angle, you need to be careful, is the angle on the numerator minus the angle on the denominator. But the angle on the denominator itself already has a negative sign. So we have two negative signs here, which is pi divided by three plus pi divided by six, which is pi over two. And actually, those two answers are the same. The mod, in other words, exponential j pi divided by two equals j, which you can plot by yourself on the complex plane because it's just a number that lies on the vertical axis. In other words, the 
imaginary axis. Yes, uh, for the private question, can I write Z modulus angle? In polar form, you can write either in as complex exponential or use the standard form modulus angle. Either way is okay. And from an observation from this example is that it's usually simpler to calculate multiplications and divisions in the polar form. That's much simpler. Okay. To summarize, uh, this lecture we've mainly learned about complex numbers. We first introduced the definition of an imaginary number and then complex number. We defined the modulus and the conjugate of complex numbers. We learned two different representations, a rectangular representation, polar representation. And polar representation, we can write it as modulus angle and also write it as modulus and the complex exponential. We've practiced the addition, subtraction, multiplication, division with complex numbers in different coordinates. Okay. So those are all the knowledge I would like to uh, deliver to you about the complex numbers. And with this knowledge, I believe it is adequate for you to work out problem four and five for the in the homework. But next, let's come to the subject of this class, signal systems. The purpose we learn complex numbers, as I said at the very beginning, is to introduce the concept of complex exponential signals, which are fundamental for signal analysis. So next, let's see what is complex exponential signal. Let's first look at a special case, a simple special case, which is the real exponential signal. Because real number is a special case of complex number. And for simplicity, we start with a continuous time real exponential signal, which is just this thing. X of t with time t is c times exponential a t. Here, Without loss of generality, let's assume the capital C is a positive real number. And A is also a real constant, but it can be positive or negative. The signal looks different depending on the sign of A. Say if A is positive, so if both C and A are positive, then we plot the signal X of T on the time axis. So this horizontal axis is time T, the vertical axis is the value of this signal x of t. Then as t increases, the value increases exponentially. Actually, it, uh, it ramps up very fast as t increases. And if, let's keep c positive, but let's make, let's assume this time that a is a negative real number. For a being negative, then the exponential signal looks the other way. It starts from a very big value, but it decays to close to zero. But regardless, it is increasing or decaying, the exponential signal always keeps non-negative or, or keeps positive action. So these are the structures of real exponential signals, C times exponential A T. For imaginary, uh, so, sorry, for complex exponential signals, we extend both C and A from real number to complex number. So in particular, C this time is a complex number, C modulus exponential J phi. So phi is the angle of this complex number C. And A, without loss of generality, let's assume that A is a pure imaginary number. Because if A has any non-zero real part, then this real part can be absorbed into the coefficient C. 
That's why we, it is sufficient for us to retain the imaginary part of it. And it doesn't matter whether omega is positive or negative, but as a convention, let's assume omega is positive because it's, if it's negative, then we just have additional exponential to the power minus one, which can be merged with C. Okay. So with the C and A introduced in this way, we can uh, convert the signal C e to the power a t as follows. So we have C modulus, which is a possible real number. We have exponential j omega zero t, which is e which equals exponential a t. And then we have additional exponential j phi because we have exponential j phi here. Don't forget the phi here. Just reorganize a little bit so that we can write it in this way. And applying the Euler's equation, exponential j omega zero t plus phi can be written as cosine omega zero t plus phi plus j sine omega zero t plus phi. So a complex exponential signal c times e to the power a t itself is a complex number that changes with t. Both the real part and the imaginary part changes with t in these ways. Here we only focus on the real part because if you look at the imaginary part, it just changed from cosine to sine. Perhaps you are familiar with this. If we change from cosine to sine, it's just a shift of 90 degrees. So the structure does not change a lot. That's why it's okay for us to focus on the real part itself. We plot c modulus cosine omega zero t plus phi looks like, looks the following. First, it's, a, it's oscillating signal. Magnitude is C modulus, which means the peak is C modulus. If we take t equals zero, so at the particular time t equals zero, the value of this signal is C cosine phi, so, which intercepts the vertical axis at this point, c cosine phi. And if you look at the distance between two peaks, or equivalently the distance between the two valleys, it is two pi divided by omega zero. Because every time t changes by this amount, omega zero of t changes by two pi. And if a cosine signal changes by two pi, it come back, comes back to the peak. Therefore, this t0, which is two pi divided by omega zero, is the fundamental period of this signal. So this is a period, continuous time periodic signal. The foundational period is this. And further, if we increase the parameter omega zero, the signal will oscillate faster or slower. So let's think about this question. So how to understand this? If omega zero is larger, means we increase omega zero, this T zero becomes smaller, which means the distance between these two peaks are smaller. If it becomes smaller, then it oscillates more frequently. So the answer is A, it will oscillate faster, equivalently more frequently. Therefore, omega zero measures how frequent this cosine signal changes. Or to generalize the statement, it measures how frequent this complex exponential signal oscillates. Therefore, it is called the fundamental frequency of the cosine signal. And also it is the fundamental frequency of the complex exponential signal. Because cosine and sine signals are changing the same way, just a constant pi over two difference. And the relationship between fundamental period and fundamental frequency is the following. If we multiply the fundamental period and the fundamental frequency, their product is two pi. So these are the concepts of fundamental period and frequency for the complex exponential signal. Now, let's extend this concept a little bit more 
in the previous slide, we consider A to be a pure imaginary number. And I said, if we have a non-negative real part for A, let's denote it by R, then we just have an additional exponential RT here. Then everything keeps the same except this exponential RT. But pay attention that this exponential RT changes over T. So this time, the magnitude of this oscillating signal is no longer constant, but the magnitude itself changes over time. For R larger than zero, exponential RT is ramping up over T. And if we multiply it with a cosine, then we have an oscillating signal whose magnitude of oscillation ramps up over time t. On the other hand, if we have r less than zero, exponential r t is decaying with time t. So the magnitude of this oscillating signal is decaying, approaching zero. In this case, if we measure the distance between the two peaks, so if we measure the distance from this peak to this peak, it's still the same as the last slide, which is 2 pi divided by omega 0. The only thing that changes is the magnitude of this oscillation changes over time t. So this is a generalized form of complex exponential signal. It not only oscillates according to the fundamental frequency omega 0, but its magnitude also changes according to the real part of this exponent A. These are the uh, real-time complex exponential signals. Of course, we have a real-time concept. We have a corresponding, uh, we have a, a discrete-time counterpart. The discrete-time exper complex exponential signals uh, a little bit more complicated. Since already towards the end of the class, uh, I would prefer to have an early release today and we will learn discrete time complex exponential signals in the Friday lecture. And don't forget that starting from this week, the second lecture on Friday will be TA tutorial. We will stay in the same uh, Zoom room as the ordinary lecture. Okay, uh, see you on Friday, thanks.